Welcome to the Sidious Mag Podcast. I'm Chris Chavez. I am Kyle Merber. And I am Mac Fleet. On today's show, we recap the 2023 U.S. Cross Country Championships and share who is headed to represent Team USA at the World Cross Country Championships next month in Australia. Mac is going to tell us a bit about his trip to Boulder, where he got to witness the On Athletics Club's crazy workouts that have blown up the internet this week. Plus, it's going to be a remarkable weekend of track and field action. So we're going to pick some of the key races to watch at the Lilac Grand Prix, the Dr. Sander Invitational, the BU Terrier Classic, and the Razorback Invitational. But let's start by welcoming back Mac to the show. You've had quite an eventful last couple of days. Set the scene for us. I guess like this trip, it was a pretty last minute planned. You kind of heard through the grapevine there was going to be some big workout being thrown thrown down and we got invited which is cool because i mean that it, it's not every single time that a team you know opens its doors and says hey like this is something something cool is going to happen yeah um you know we, we're always looking for youtube content so i had a spare weekend and you know texted weeding said hey what, what does the crew's uh, schedule look like before you guys go to boston for the bu meet and yeah he said uh, the crew's gonna have a pretty big workout on sunday so i think the Thursday or Friday before we, you know, I got my ticket and headed out there and um, weeding told me what the paces were likely to be. And I texted you guys that we might get a sub four, you know, for the men and we might get a sub four thirty four. Wait, describe Alicia. the split situation, the splits that were on paper, what they added up to and what well, it was supposed it, to be. In the parentheses, it said 406, but the splits added up to 402. and <laughs> Which is like, I would say a, a very normal thing for a lot of good coaches. It's like the 406 is probably the correct like math pace, but the 402 is like, a, yeah, you could also run 402 and we'll be happy with that. But as a coach, I think you're trying to get the guys like to run closer to the 402. And then knowing that and knowing like that everyone's all amped up to run fast. If anything is, is close to a barrier, like four minutes, you're going to run under it. Like Dathan knew, even though he had 406 and 402 on that list, he knew they were going to run under four minutes. So there's all these mind games that kind of go into that. Um, yeah. So yeah, going out there, it was, it was awesome. It was super controlled. Um, there was like a really strong purpose to the workout. Uh, Dathan had a really clear set out like plan of this has to be a progression no matter what um, for Alicia and for the guys. And yeah, it was really, I like seeing non-dramatic, you know, like there, no one was upset that it was fast. No one was like really amped up about it either. Um, it, it had like a really purposeful, you know, like, I don't know, intent behind it. Um, yeah, it was really fun to watch. It was fun to have waiting there as well, former teammate from college and, you know, OTC and we're just fans watching it. It was really cool. So, that, I mean, it's kind of like we've, trickled a little bit of what you got to see because we put out the 1600 meter rep that was shared on Joe Klecker's Strava that that's when the buzz started to you know get out and then we were just like well now people actually have to see this because and we have the footage so we released that then the second part of that was releasing the Alicia Monson 1600 which was I would argue more impressive uh than the guys and then we've got, I guess, more details and more footage to come later this week uh, as Mac is currently editing and working on that video. I guess, can you let the people know, I guess, what is what is to come in just seeing Sage and Josette uh, in, and the rest of the team participating? Yeah, it's, oh, right before we started recording this, I've been listening to about an hour to 90 minutes of license-free music. So I'm, I'm going a little bit crazy here as I'm trying to find two usable songs for a YouTube video. It's horrible. Um, everyone's fit, the whole crew, vibes are high. Um, Sage, Cinta, they had a fantastic workout. Joe Zett is transitioning, I would say, remarkably well into their team. Um, she's pumped to have a bunch of training partners. Um, I think over the last year, it's just been her and Robbie. And um, who else was there working out? The whole Dathan. Dathan was having Dathan. a very good workout. Dathan seems to be the star of the show. Um, with his blue jean, you know, 
miles that he's getting in. Uh, but yeah, no, the, the, the whole thing was super controlled. And like, just to put into context, like what was like, they're racing five or six days after that workout. I think that was kind of lost amongst people watching it. Like, oh, this isn't the craziest workout I've ever seen. It's like, yeah, it's not their craziest workout either. They, they're racing this week. Um, and yeah, just super thankful for the access. And uh, I think that's the cool takeaway. A little snapshot. That's the takeaway is like, if any pros are ever going to do something really impressive, just text Mac and he'll be there to cover it. Cause I mean, the reaction has been unbelievable. Like people just love watching that stuff. And a lot of times you'll hear athletes say like, our workouts are harder than the races a lot of the time. And, you know, it's, it's showing up and actually getting to witness that. I think, you know, puts it in context for people. It's like, yeah, yeah no, it's that's, super cool. That's true. And- and I'll say like, just from like a business perspective from us, it's kind of cool. And, you know, Kyle and Chris, like the marketing aspect of it, it's also cool on social media to see something that's organic like that, that's unedited, that has like very little push behind it from like any company or us. Like, yeah, there's groundwork behind. We're, we're a company. And us, <laughs> is, and us is Sidious. <laughs> but like, it, both of those are five minute long unedited clips, mm-hmm. you know? And it's just like, thrown out there it was a single effort from alicia and a single effort from all of those guys um and it blew up on on the internet it's it's really cool to see yeah and kind of like what where we kind of position ourselves in the track media landscape is that we want to kind of add context and just excitement around the athletes and the upcoming meets because again to the point like there just isn't enough storytelling that's done and for us like even though those are just straight up workout clips, I feel like there's a great population of people who are excited to now see how that's going to translate Friday night when the guys tackle the 5k at BU or this weekend when Sage opens up with uh, the 1k or, and Alicia's in the, in the mile. So, I mean, there's, there's more intrigue and I guess like it's, it's going to be hard for the coffee club guys to say that, uh, there's there's still some rust to be busted because it they look like they look pretty good right now. Real quick question before we we plug our generous sponsor Olipop. For you guys, is there a particular workout in mind that from your pro days that you wish someone would have been there to film? I, I kind of like from my experience, I've heard stories of David Torrance throwing down some crazy stuff back in the day, and you would see things on on Strava, but if you do, is there anything that comes to mind of like i wish someone would have been there to film that with a camera because it people would have gotten really excited um <clears throat> in college i did a workout my senior year i did a seven and a half mile tempo in the morning nothing like crazy fast just low fives and then in the evening i did six by 200 and i ran 22 high and i that's the fastest I've ever run for a 200. And like, if I had that on camera, I would love to just time it again, just to make sure that that was legit. So that's a personal thing, but that was, you know, the, the, one rep is really cool to, you know, have on film. Like that's that 357 or 426. And for me, like my lifetime 200 best on film would be sweet. But not, what about something that's not you? Have you heard of like something? Oh, where it's like, yeah, I don't care about other people. <laughs> That's a this is a selfish thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you you hear people's workouts and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate to witness a lot of things myself, like that are crazy from other people, like Mo and crew doing twelve by a K in Sedona like, is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen on a track. Um, I can't. You know, we I were know supposed to talk it. about. We were supposed to talk about other people, and here I am talking about myself. Um, well, I mean, I've, yeah, sure. I, what's the best workout that I wish that Matt, you were very good at working out. Oh, workout King. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have like a lot of, I have a lot of like sub one fifties in the middle of workouts. Like that, that was nonchalant for me. Sub Any sub three thirty eight. I bet you, I could have done that in practice. I bet you <laughs> Lord knows, man. <laughs> mac mac made 10 by 400 in sub 60 like his like first workout of the season i feel like it was like I all right let's okay get so started so there's one trevor dunbar has that has like the best workout video of all time him yeah. running nine minutes in the blizzard 
um, my Mac fleet version of that would have been eight by 460 seconds rest running sub 60 in high school. That was, yeah. So like, that's my, my, that would have been cool on the internet. So my thing is that I'm drinking an Olipop right now and we forgot to do the plug earlier. And uh, I don't know if you guys saw this. This is an Olipop, you know? Yeah, I guess explain it for the good people who may be watching this on YouTube, what you decided to mix. Because, you yeah, know, so we like we like Olipop just straight up, but you can also use it as a mixer. So I've got I've got the tropical punch here and I'm following Olipop on Instagram and they keep doing different cocktails. So I made a little gin tropical punch myself. But I saw someone and this I mean, we've all thought of it just doing the root beer float. And I think that's maybe next week for me. Oh, can you bring it onto the show and show people? Is a root beer float a cocktail? <laughs> it's a mocktail. <laughs> yeah, a little rum. All right. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect plug for people to follow Drink Olipop on Instagram because they're also crushing it on social media. I think one of the things we told them, I think when we met with them was like, hey, listen, you guys have tapped into, into some pretty huge influencers. And it's like, we, we've got the runners. Uh, so that's why, you know, we made kind of a really good partnership with them. But their social game is fantastic. Did so you see they did the courtside Thing yes. at the Denver Nuggets game, they just had one of someone from their team dress up in a big can <laughs> costume. We need that person at Milrose Games or an upcoming meet. Just have someone just totally dressed up in an Olipop can. Yeah, that or yeah, I like it. Well, it's, we'll, I feel we'll work like, on that. Or are you like, guys on set? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely becoming the runner soda. I'll say that. I mean, I'm loving all the tags that we're getting on social media. So if you're drinking an Olipop while listening to this podcast or at any point, tag us on Instagram. We'd love to see it. Olipop is a prebiotic soda with only two to five grams of sugar. That is really good for your gut health, and it's delicious. Use code Sidious25 for 25% off non-subscription orders. You can learn more at drinkolipop.com or click the link and use our promotional code in the in the show notes and description Check them out today, Olipop. All right, next thing up, USATF Cross Country Championships took place this past weekend in Richmond, Virginia. We'll start with the men's race. Edna Kurgott won her first U.S. title ahead of McKenna Morley and Emily Durgan. Kurgott took off at 2K and pressed on before closing with a 306 final kilometer and notching a 3206 win for the 10K course. Wayne Kaladi and Katie Izzo are joining those three ladies on the world championship team. And everyone is repping team USA for the very first time in their careers. Kyle, I love the reasons that you listed off for why you're rooting for each one of the people in this week's lap count newsletter. For me personally, I mean, Wayne Kaladi gave me a, a, like a little bit of a heart attack during that race because it's like, she was a favorite going into it. We, she was the runner up last year. We saw how close she came to making teams on the track last year. And it's like, all right, this is the first, you know, senior national team that she's got a really good shot of making because, you know, I did a podcast episode with her back in 2021. And, you know, it was around the time that she was trying to finalize the process for her to represent the United States. She defected from Eritrea in 2014 while coming here for uh, World Juniors and didn't go home, didn't see family for eight plus years. and. You know, it's it's got all the makings of a feel good story that for her to show up to the cross country championships on home soil for her in Virginia injured like it was she had so many things working against her the week of like she said she told Johnny Pace who was, just, who was doing our interviews afterwards that, you know, she could barely run going into the race and it was looking like it was slipping by but she found a way to make the team. She's going to be representing Team USA for the first time ever. Finally gets that moment. So particularly for me, Wayne Nicolotti was was one of the best stories of the day. But you also had uh, a chance to highlight some of the other runners on the team. So who else stood out to you? Yeah, well, uh, just quickly touching on Wayne, like her making the team is great for Team USA because she is a low stick for us. You know, if she can do this off of uh, an injury and, you know, not running for a week, at full form, what we've seen the last year, she's going to be mixing it up. You know, well, she the- said uh, in the posters interviews, like, you're not going to see this version of Wayne at Worlds. Like, I'm going to be ready and yeah. something big is going to happen. So I'm ready for that. Yeah, of course. And then, you know, I'm excited for her college teammate, 
Um, you know, Edna, the 2017 NCAA champion, uh, you know, look, she's had a, a solid pro career, but it, you know, for an NCAA champion, the expectation is you're going to make teams and, um, you know, she's run some solid track time so far, and she's just only starting to experiment with the roads recently. And she's, she's doing really well with it, but her momentum's building right now. And she's, you know, she's a cross country runner. So I, uh, I think that, you know, she's someone with the trajectory is right is, you know, she having a teammate in a race like world cross, which is chaos is going to be super helpful. And then speaking of teammates, we've got three athletes all coached by Terrence Mahone going. So um, Mac, I, you know, I, you've had the opportunity to see Emily Lapari up close before, you know, that probably not completely unexpected to see her making the team. No, uh, Emily's a phenomenal talent. Um, and it was always impressive to see how well, even when she was more of a 15 runner, I think she's moving up now. Even when she was primarily doing 15, she was always really strong and, and could always hang with some of the longer distance women um, on tempos and stuff like that. And Emily is someone that takes maybe like 10 days to get fit. You know, there's those type of runners. So yeah, and Emily can grind. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see her, Emily or Katie all make that team. Yeah. Emily Durgan's the other one that you mentioned who I believe David Melly like tweeted out some sort of stat where it was like, she was, what was it? 17th or something like that. And the only NCAA cross country championship. No, 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 that no, she no, no, no. She was 115. Oh, okay. Big difference there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that was the only NCAA cross championship that she participated in. And now you know, she's stuck with it in the sport, at, has found quite a bit of success as a professional and is now heading uh, to Australia. So uh, kudos to that squad. Let's uh, take a look here at the men's side and how it shook out. Emmanuel Bohr opened up a lead after 3K and similar to Edna Kerr got just pressed on from there. Narrowly won. I mean, there was a big pack of guys closing pretty hard. I think, uh, you know, second through seventh or something like that, or third through seventh was separated by less than uh, less than a second, which was kind of crazy. So for Bohr, this was the first uh, U.S. title that he has ever won. He's 34 years old, and he gets a chance of redemption. I mean, he ran on that crazy uh, course a couple of years ago in, was it Denmark? Um, the, the one that they ran over, like, the museum. So he ran there, didn't do all that well. He said that he's looking forward to this chance to, go back and, you know, try and improve on, on how he did. And same for Andrew Colley, except like the window is much longer. He represented team USA, uh, at the 2015 world cross country championships has had a slew of injuries, got a big feature in the lap count this week. I recommend people go and check that out and read it. It's also on SidiousMag.com. He finishes second. Then you've got Anthony Rotich, Sam Chalanga, the vet, uh, Dylan Maggard, uh, making the rest of the team for the world championships. So, uh, oh, and the big change was Leonard career also finished in that top six, but opted not to go. Uh, and instead, uh, who is it? Reed Buchanan will be going in his place. So that is team USA. Emmanuel bore pretty impressive. And like, you know, this is, he's kind of been consistently in that top three, and or top five across like the U S road racing championships that we saw last year. And now this time he kind of really proved himself on the cross country scene. I'm, I'm not totally shocked, but I am excited to see how he does at the world championships. Yeah. You know, I feel for Emmanuel last year, he qualified for the world indoor championships to go to Serbia, but the U S army had not granted him leave uh, for security reasons. And so we found out very late beforehand, it seemed like that, Hey, you can't go. And it's, it's tough because he was in amazing shape. He ran 13 flat indoors and uh, he did get an opportunity to represent the U S at NACAC during the summer, but God bless NACAC. It's just not a world championship. And um, you know, so for not, him to have that opportunity to come back and really do it um, again, it's great to see. And then also, you know, familiar faces with him out there, uh, a bunch of, people that he trains with on a regular basis will be going and we're seeing that on the women's side. And that's really valuable. I mean, look, it's a long flight to Australia. You want to have people, you know, to talk to along the way. 
Uh, he's been he's being coached by Heron Lagat, right? Kyle. I guess you've kind of traded some messages with him over the the past year. What's going on with with that training group? It's 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 pretty special. Yeah, I mean they've got a really really talented group out there. Um, you know they're it's kind of a a mixed bag in Colorado right now. You've got some people who are training under Scott Simmons, others with Heron Lagat, but um, you know the the U.S. Army squad has great history going to world cross and look, it's, it's going to be extremely, extremely tough for us to break into the top three. I think we know that um, looking at the Ugandan, Ethiopian and Kenyan squad, like those are just the top three favorites right now. And I actually think like Kenya hasn't been that exceptional on the track compared to like history. Um, you know, I, the, a lot of the top Kenyans are now focusing on the roads, but like everyone is seemingly doing cross country. So they're my favorites. It's going to be tough for us to break into that top three, but having guys who've been there before and who are making this the focus of their season, which a guy like Emmanuel Bohr is like, he, he's not doing the marathon buildup. Like he is going to do this and then he's going to get ready for outdoor track. And so this is circled on the calendar. What do, you, what do you think makes a successful a successful showing for both these sides at World Cross? You, you, you threw out not top three. Top three would be a reach goal for the men. But on both sides, are we thinking top five on both? Yeah, I mean, let's beat all of Europe, right? Like, yeah. I think at the very least, um, you know, Japan historically has had some good squads. I think, you know, I think, you know, if breaking into that top five is is very solid, like, look, realistically, there's a lot of top talent from the U S that isn't going like, mm-hmm. we know that like the Bowerman track club is not represented. OAC is not represented like a team with Grant Fisher on it. You know, maybe we have a better shot of, you know, vying for those, those top podium spots, but um, you know, this is a good team and it's a experienced cross country team, which is different than the track. I know you ultimately don't make the calls. It's a Jerry Schumacher and Dathan Ritzenheim <laughs> call, but like for the fans who might be wondering and are not as familiar, why do sometimes coaches hold back some of these top athletes? Is it just because cross country might seem like a bit of an injury risk or, or w- what is the reasoning behind it? Mac, do you want to take this one? You've been, <laughs> you, you've uh, yeah, played I the mean, coaching th- game before. There's, there's, there's injury risk. And then there's also like, you're trying to set yourself up for, for your best shot outdoors. So people are people that are running the 10K, like running the 10, the sound running the 10, they're already in sequence to run that. Like Joe Klecker, yeah, he's going to run well, like in these next two indoor races, but like his cycle, he's already onto the 10. Like this whole bit is for that. Um, I do think that Sage will run if enough people decline their spots. Um, for the for relay. The relay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not that everyone is against it. There's also that aspect where, you know, be some of these like. Yeah, there might be someone from like New Balance Boston who's like on that short list in the same case, like they will do the relay. Waiting for that. Um, And it's it's cross country. There's yeah, there's just there's a bigger chance of you getting hurt, rolling an ankle, something that's like stupid. I know all of these athletes, if they go there and they come back with some stupid injury, they'll be kicking themselves door to door. It's it's a U.S. team. So you want that kick. Door to door, it's it's 30 plus hours for most of these athletes, right? Like, and so when you think about that, it's like, all right, you you get a short run in before a morning flight, you sit on a plane forever, you get off, you have no idea what time it is, you go for a short shakeout because you're obviously not going to do anything big beforehand. And so this is not the sort of race that you're flying in the day before and just hopping in to it. Like you're, and then the same thing on the way back, like when you're flying back you're not going to work out for at least two or three days at like the very least. And so it is a big commitment to go all the way to Australia. And, you know, that, that shouldn't be undersold. I think if the, the world cross uh, me, it was in the U S then we could give everyone a much harder time for it. But uh, it's, I think if there's ever a year in which it's reasonable, it is this year. I know last week you harped on and you gave me crap for like, oh, Chris never ran in college and didn't run professionally. So like he asks dumb questions sometimes. Here's one. Uh, maybe back in the day, because it was a much bigger deal, but contracts for pros, are they incentivized if they medal at the World Cross Country Championships? I had, I don't think I had anything of the sort, but I wasn't a cross country runner. So that wasn't really in it for me. Um, but like, 
yeah, like some of these athletes, especially if you're someone who's interested, like you're negotiating in your contract. If you're someone who knows that they're going to try to run this one day, that's going to be in there. But like realistically, I mean, Americans don't come in the top three. (laughs) So like we don't do that. And then from a shoe company's perspective, like is eighth place at world cross selling any shoes or like really worth anything. Like it's not a sexy result. Look, it's unfortunate. I think maybe USATF is the one who should be incentivizing some bonuses for a top 10 or top 15, top 20 finish. But even still, like we've seen time and time again, like money doesn't move the needle as much as you want with the top, top dogs. All right. That was my one. Uh, Chris didn't run professionally question of the week. Um, All right. We had some really good races on the U20 side. I'm actually like pretty encouraged and like excited, you know, when you say like, oh, as the pros don't necessarily crack like that top 10, top eight sometimes. I mean, in some cases they do, but it's not all as common. But with Irene Riggs and uh, Leo Young, but those two are like top talents that I think like I'm I'm really excited that the fact that they ran this thing because everyone kind of thought, oh, Nike Cross Country Nationals may have been like the big one of the year, but this is a chance to represent Team USA and get a free flight all the way to Australia. Good experience learning to race against international talent. And those are two really big stars that I think like I'm excited to see how they would fare against, you know, the U20s from East Africa. And so, uh, I mean, for Irene, she closed her final K in 303. She won the 6K race in, in 1944. Leo Young, it was a story of redemption. Like we, a lot of people saw what happened. We're in the final, you know, kilometer of the final half mile, basically of maybe less than that of NXN. Like he just kind of, he didn't have it in him. He's going backwards. And now he ended up run winning his first ever 8k 2345, pretty impressive time. Like he's going to get used to that. Get used to that because he's going to be running 8k's in college constantly. It was a really good performance one by seven seconds, only high schooler, I believe on the U 20 team. So all around just some really impressive performances there on the U 20 side of things. Was there anything uh, that got you excited for that Kyle? I mean, I'm excited to see how the the ladies mix it up. This is an exceptionally good team by U.S. standards um, between Irene Riggs, uh, Kara Beloga, and Ellie Shea. Now, let's just to look a little bit at history here. Uh, in 2019, the top uh, the top 13 individuals were. The, the entire Ethiopian team, the entire Kenyan team, and one Ugandan athlete, and the top American was fifty third. Wow. Okay. I think we. I, I think this, we're finishing better than that this time around. I do think we're finishing better than that. I mean, ultimately, the U.S. women uh, finished fourteenth, which you know, not our best result. Um, but I, I it, like. It is really, really a different ball game on the junior level because, you know, like it's it's just like you see it already. Like the Kenyans and the Ethiopians are not like just competing on the junior level when they're 19 years old. They're competing on the Olympic level. Yeah. <laughs> and so like it's it's difficult to contend with that. Yeah. If anything, we're going to get a really nice sick vlog from Leo Young uh, out of this. He's getting a trip to Australia. Like that's, that's exciting. So I'm looking forward to to that one. I Um, loved how excited he was to be going like, yeah, just absolutely fired up about it. And also, you know, his brother, I think gave such an awesome interview afterwards. I think he He finished 12th that the assumption would be that finishing 12th, that he'd be disappointed. turns out he's been super injured and the furthest he had run in like recent history was seven miles. Yeah. So check those out on our uh, YouTube channel. Johnny Pace crushed it on the sidelines for us out there. I'll be with him uh, this weekend. So uh, hoping to get some more. He just brings out like, he's so positive and nice when he approaches the athletes that uh, it makes for a good interview. So check those out. Some other, some other notable quick hits that took place this weekend. Uh, Nikki Hiltz ran a 432 mile in Flagstaff, which is worth 422 at sea level with the conversion. So uh, not the only impressive altitude mile uh, that we've seen in the past week. Molly Seidel shared that she will be running 
the Nagoya Marathon in Japan. She said that on the Alley on the Run show, which is exciting. You know, people have been, you know, when you're a pro of that level, sometimes the inclination is chase the dollar signs and go, you know, to the biggest appearance fee, which probably could have been Boston. But Molly probably recognizes at this point in her career, you've got all these really other really cool opportunities. It doesn't have to be the same sort of Boston, New York, Boston, New York cycle. So good on Molly for that. Cameron well, also, Myers. Yeah. If, if we can dive into this a little bit, I remember when we were in Boston, we were like, I can't believe how much Molly is doing. And like anywhere you go, she's getting swarmed by people. And at this point, she just needs to go like the buildup. It, we're, we're like, we, the buildup to the Olympic trials has started for the marathoners and she's got to go put one on the board. Like mm -hmm. she, I don't think she has to hit a home run in Japan, but you know, hitting a singular double and getting that momentum back. And I think that's going to be a lot easier for her to do in a situation in which, you know, you're not getting stopped every three seconds for a picture and an autograph. I will Cameron, say that yeah. it is, uh, it's, it's insane what some of these top American marathoners have to do at these majors in terms yeah. of appearances. Like I, I don't think fans understand uh, the amount of events that they have to go to the week prior to them racing. It's exhausting. It's, um, it's, it is exhausting. Like it's exhausting being around it. I can't even imagine being them. Yeah. In some ways, like being asked to do the press conference is good. Cause you get to represent your sponsor and like, you're talking to media, but at this other side of things, it's sort of like, it's a relief. You're like, oh, I don't have to dress up for this thing. I don't have to go down. I don't have to sit around and then like, you know, kind of delay whatever your day is like you get thrown out of your routine for a couple of days. So, um, yeah, some it's good not insight. Everyone's, it's yeah. not everyone's personality. Like, yeah. Think of it, think of like the quintessential like distance runner that you like the stereotype. Are they one who's gonna go mingle for hours on end? Like that's not most distance runners. Maybe you can put on for like an hour here and there if you're getting a good enough appearance fee, but like the majority of people, it's that's not an easy aspect of the job. So um yeah, all right. I, I like it. All right, sorry, you run down. Go on. Yeah. Cameron Myers, 16 year old from Australia, ran 340 for uh, the 1500, just two seconds off of max PR. Uh, on the NCAA front, we saw two collegiate records with Julian Alford going 702 in the 60 meters and Masai Russell of Kentucky owning the 60 meter hurdle uh, record in 7.75. So Kentucky really holding it down in the hurdles as always. On the high school front, Nicholas Harbor, the big boy, our boy, went 6.66 .66 in the 60 meters. Just, I mean, I live for the highlight clips that he shares on social. Then you've got uh, Missouri high schooler Jackson uh, Hedish. Hedish, I will get that right by the end of the season because he's probably going to break some sort of record. He went 842 for two miles, is now sitting at number two on the all-time list. So those were just some other results that took place across the country. Um, but... I wanted to really dive in and take a look at the weekend ahead of us, because if you thought that that was a lot, there's going to be so much more coming up. And here, if, if you're listening to this, take out a little pen and paper uh, so you can write down, you know, what, what to watch and what you're looking forward to, because we put up a nice little graphic on the Sidious Mag Instagram and real quick, I'll run down what is coming up. We got the Lilac Grand Prix on Friday night. 9 p.m. Eastern time, free live stream on the Tracklandia YouTube channel, courtesy of Hayward Magic. They, you know, uh, decided to sponsor the broadcast and wanted more as many people as possible to be able to access it. So take down that barrier to entry, make it free, let people watch the stars. The meet's going to feature Cole Hawker making his season debut. Sinclair Johnson also opening up. Uh, Clayton Murphy, who just won at the American Track League this past weekend in the K. Eleanor Fulton, basically, uh, right, you know, she's a hometown hero up in Portland, just making the drive up. She's going to be ready to crush. Isaiah Harris also uh, racing there. That's the Lilac Grand Prix, Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Then also taking place on Friday, but mo more so collegiate action, uh, will be the Dr. Sander Invitational. Saturday is the real heart of that meet. I'll be there. Two to two, uh, 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. It will be streamed on usatf.tv with a subscription. Uh, it The meet features Sage Herta Klecker, 
versus Ajay Wilson in the 1000 meters, which we could see an American record go down. Initially, Sage was announced as the headliner for that race. And then today we got the update that Ajay was racing in it. And Ajay's number two on the US all time list. So, and on top of that, has not lost a race at the Armory since 2013. So it's probably going to be the race to watch at that meet. Caitlin Tui uh, is also racing, I believe, in the mile. Um, Alicia Monson, fresh off of that uh, 426, 1600 at altitude, which she kind of joked around and said that it was basically a 12 second mile PR for her. Now she'll get a legit mile PR in this race. We've got Drew Hunter and Eric Holt racing in the mile vying for that one spot that will be, uh, you know, that is on the line for the Milrose games want to make her mile. So some really cool storylines there at the Dr. Sander invitational. I'm really looking forward to it. Then we've got the BU Terrier classic taking place on both Friday and Saturday. It's streaming on flow track. You need a subscription for that one as well. And it features the on athletics club guys. I believe the 5K on Friday night is going to be taking place at around 8 p.m. Ollie Hoare is pacing that. Uh, it's going to be paced for about 13.05, but knowing that every, everyone's going to kind of, once the pacer drops off, people are going to actually start to race. We could see a sub-13. Who knows? You've got the OAC guys in that one. You've got Luis Grijalva in it. You've got people from the Very Nice Track Club. So that'll be one to watch. Annie Rodenfels, who rarely ever loses at BU, will be entered in the women's uh, 3K or mile, one of the two. I've got to double check that. Uh, but she will be there as well. Then you've got the Razorback Invitational on Friday and Saturday. You can watch that on the SEC Network. A lot of fast DMRs taking place there. Stanford, Oklahoma State will be in the house. But really, the marquee event to watch there will be Britton Wilson, who we just saw uh, break the collegiate record in the 600. Now she's going to go up, and she's going to run the 800. So that is everything that's taking place this weekend. I'm sure there's going to be some random time and some stellar performance that's not on the World Athletics calendar or something like that. Uh, but um, track is back. What are you looking forward to the most, Kyle? Oof, man, what a loaded. I mean, I love that Ajay is getting in that thousand versus Sage. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ajay is not currently on the start list for anything in Milrose. No, and, not yet. So, I mean, like, this could be just sort of like, let's take the temperature of like where she's at, you know, in terms of fitness. Could she try and jump into the race against a thing or could she try her hand at the Watermaker mile? I don't know. I have long argue that it is time for Ajay to move up and become the next queen of the 1500. I think that she has unbelievable potential at the event. And uh, like, we know she's quick. Obviously she, she could run a fast 600. She's run 122 before um, that was outdoors. And, you know, she's run 155 and she's a world champ, but like she ran uh 405 and for 1500 before like five years ago or something at a small meet uh in Swarthmore, pennsylvania and um <laughs> she but she's really strong like for an 800 runner like she's obviously fast but like we've never seen aj considered for the four by four at worlds or anything like she's strong and i think that she could certainly break four minutes for 1500 if she made the event her focus but i think that ajay has 100 percent olympic medal potential of 1500 meters and i'm hoping that this thousand is a little test and then she decides to run wanamaker and it's the start of a new era wow uh i've also heard like some crazy stories from like way back in the New Jersey high school days where it's like, it wasn't uncommon to see Ajay running the 1600 and correct me if I'm wrong. When she ran the dream mile back when that was a thing at the Adidas grand prix, I believe like she ran it in like sprinter spikes and like did pretty well. Um, that's how I guess new to the, to the longer distance Ajay was. Cause I think like in her heart, she's always been four, eight. It's time. It's time now it's, it's time to move up B eight, uh, 15 or eight mile. Uh, so I'm with you on that one. I think that is going to be the, uh, race for Saturday afternoon. Mac, was there anything else that stood out to you? Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, Clayton is running at Lilac, correct? Yes. 
Yeah, I'm I'm excited for for Clayton's indoor season and how that leads into his outdoor season. I think he's healthy and uh, he seems confident. And when he's healthy and confident, he is one of the best in the world. And I I want to see him back there. And it I kind of get the feeling that he's on his way. So I'm, I'm excited to him to see him string a few of these races together. Can we break down Lilac a little bit more? Because I feel like. I didn't even realize until a day ago that Cole Hawker is opening up his season in the three K. Yeah. Um, and you know, people forget he was people forget. the uh, U S champion in it and then decided to pass on uh worlds. But I mean, he showed out and he won two titles last year. And then the other athlete that I think, you know, we should all be watching is Sinclair Johnson. You know, here I am saying that Ajay has got the, the Olympic medal potential 1500, if Sinclair continues this trajectory that she had going last year, then I think she does as well. And so, you know, kicking off the U S champ season, um, these fields are great. And, you know, I'm excited that this meet will be free to watch. I like the Friday meet personally, you know, um, pers- like I kind of live this life. My Fridays are the quiet night now. Um, and so, you know, I'm out with the boys on Saturdays. <laughs> I can't be watching track Saturday nights. Is the rule still Leisha can only watch track on, t- on, uh, on TV? She can watch track or Elmo <laughs> in limited quantity. All right. Um, I guess like for me, it's hard not to peg the 5K on Friday night at BU. It's just sort of like, I guess the three of us just do not want to come off like we're sipping too much on OAC Kool-Aid, but they're they look great. And I guess like to Max point that he made earlier, like maybe for Klecker, the plan is to probably be closer to that 1305 instead of, unless, you know, the plan it might be to break 13 because the sites are set on the 10 coming up next month uh, or in, in March. But, you know, this is looking at the fields, like, again, like we saw in the workout, when they're surrounded by everyone else, they're going to get carried away and they're going to run fast. So um, I, how many guys sub 13 on Friday night? Should we set the over under at sub 13 is the over under? I feel like that's unfair. No yeah, number of guys. Say, sub th- 13. Uh, Klecker did say that he would like to go under and he arguably looked the best of that whole group. Um, he's got a shot. I don't know how many other people do. <laughs> All right. So we're setting it at one and a half. <laughs> You got to smash the should be uh, a half, just a half. All right. I'll take the over. <laughs> well, a lot of people, I mean, in our experience talking with the very nice track club. Um, oh yeah, that's right. There is a lot of hype about how good of shape Morgan beetle scum is in sources, like, sources. The sources are Morgan. Um, no, the sources are like the entire team was talking about how good of shape and, you know, he, I think, looked solid in those races, but the guys kept reiterating to Xavier when he was out there and to us, um, you know, that they were in a crazy big block at that point, that they had been putting in some really, really big workouts the month leading in, and that th- that was tired legs. And I got to think that this is circled on the calendar for Morgan. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I guess, like, one thing, I forget if in that 5K, Woody Kincaid. I think is also is, is racing. They they added him to the field later on. So I mean, we saw him run twelve fifty seven there last year, and he's he's gone under multiple times. So could he be someone that also pushes it? So a lot of intrigue around uh, the five k on Friday night. But then again, like, do we come back to Britton Wilson in the the eight hundred? Like, this is it, it's funny because we clipped Dalila Muhammad saying that she wants a piece of the eight hundred after Mac and I visited her she's in the 200 in arkansas (laughs) it's like why so step up step up you know say it with your chest basically uh britain wilson i mean what is the do you have the indoor 800 it's a a thing right she holds me you're not gonna run 158 but no um i think 2015 all right, here's your chance. Now you get 30 seconds to, so we can clip it. Like, no, you got to say, look, that people, Britain Wilson will win, will beat a thing mo in the next 10 years. <laughs> I think um, 201, 
is my call. And I think, uh, you know, just getting that, that strength work in right now and then she'll drop it down later in the season, but no, love that. Love that for, uh, the, the January meets run a little bit of off distance. Perfect. All right, let's move to our buy or sell segment. Mac, we will start with you. What you buying? I'm buying Sydney, uh, running the 60 at new bounce into a grand Prix. Um, these athletes have to show up to their sponsors meet their sponsors meet. So like Nike athletes, you have to go to Prefontaine Adidas athletes. You have to go to the boost games, new bounce athletes. You have to go to new bounce into a grand prix and athletes that are as good as Sydney can choose whatever they want to do. You can choose to race nobody if you want, but you have to show up. I love her running the 60 because she's running against some big names. She's running against Sharika Jackson, um, running against Hobbs running against Briscoe. That's going to be a really good race. And uh, those are really big names. So I'm excited to see how she holds up against them. And um, she's going to beat a few of them, I, I feel like. Yeah. And I guess like people forget that she's, she tip like when she ran indoors two years ago, she opened up doing the 60 meter hurdles. So it's like, she's constantly moving down to improve. And then she went on to, you know, break uh, the world record and win the Olympic gold medal. So uh, I trust Bobby Kersey two weeks ago. I bought the gospel of Bobby Kersey on this segment and uh, I am intrigued by, by this move. So that's a good one, Mac. All right, Kyle, what are you buying? Well, say, hold on. Can I, can I, can I add, can I add something to the back of that? I'm sorry. Um, after we were talking to Delilah, Delilah was saying, what's changed about the 400 meter hurdles uh, over the past couple of years? Oh, that's and right. it's how fast people are attacking the first hurdle. So speed into the first hurdle is one of the biggest changes over the last couple of years. And that's what's, you know, it's gotten the times to start coming down further and further. So running the 60 helps Makes you sense. charge into that first hurdle. So I, I don't know. I'm just, maybe I'm putting two pieces together that are too far away, but it makes sense to me. I like that. I like that. Good, good, good catch there. Okay, Kyle, your turn. I'm going to buy Lenny Courier running U.S. Cross despite not trying to make the team or like not r- running World Cross. And, uh, you know, like he knew he said it immediately after the race, I guess, because Reed walked away knowing that evening that he wasn't going to be that he was on the team. And so, um, look, it's still a U.S. title and uh, it's a an opportunity some prize money. Yeah, some prize money, a race, and uh, you know, against a bunch of good guys. Like, good on Lenny to still be out there. Uh, you know, I was kind of saying earlier how understandable it is for people to not want to go all the way to Australia, depending on like their other goals and other races. Um, but there's still U.S. Cross champs on, like, and Lenny, good on him. All right. Good call. Nice uh, pat on the back there to Lenny. All right. I am buying the New Balance Nationals backpack if I can. Uh, We were lucky enough that uh, we were working at the meet last year and we got handed some. But if I have to cough up some money, I will buy it. The photos got released uh, earlier this week for a ton of high school kids, I guess, like you know, I was never good enough in high school to really dream of competing at uh, New Balance Nationals. But you see it now everywhere. That's kind of the motivation for some people. And in talking to some of the, the athletes last year, it was like, well, what what made you choose this meet? And it's like, well, yeah, one, it's the competition. Two, it's the atmosphere. Three, it's the backpack. The backpack is always top three. This year, I think they really crushed it. I love the colorway. New Balance Nationals backpack. I wish I could go back to school just to be, do it all over again actually commit to the sport and be good at it so that I could qualify for new bounce nationals and get this backpack. So I'm buying the backpack. And if not, if I can't buy it, I'm probably going to shove a kid in a locker to take one for myself. So, um, all right, let's move on to sell. Kyle, what are you but selling? I am selling, I'm selling carbon footprint. Oh um, God. I, can I buy carbon emissions? Um, <laughs> So you probably saw Innes Fitzgerald, a 16-year-old out of Great Britain, um, wrote a, a thoughtful open letter to the the team GB and basically said, like, don't select me for World Cross because she is very climate conscious and decided that um, she 
wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that she was doing so much damage to the environment and flying all the way to Australia. I think even more so is just the statement that it made. And it did definitely make a statement. The running community talked about it and they saw it. Um, She's super talented. At 16 years old, she finished fourth at the European Cross Championships uh, versus, you know, in a U-20 race. And she took the train there. So um, I'm not selling, you know, what she did. I was just, you know, selling carbon footprints in general. Um, I wish I stood for something. I stand for nothing. All right. Um, all right. I guess mine is I am selling books. Like <laughs> it, it's, I think we're, we're, we're all selling books. Uh, <laughs> there's so many running books that have been published within the last, like, three months and there's going to be more over the next four months we had running while black by allison desir which is a phenomenal book we've got uh lauren fleshman who's now a new york times best-selling author with her book and we got uh des linden and kara goucher uh, also coming out with their books in the next couple months it's like i think we're all just uh you know the book i'm supposed to be writing with joe kovacs is 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 not done yet and yeah, so- we need more mail but we got molly huddle and sarah slattery we got that's right i've got them all behind me Shalane. we got no boy books chris <laughs> yeah chris lear should be working on something right now it's been a <laughs> so- few years what's he working on yeah i don't know uh well we, we keep getting steve magnus books we, we have enough of those yeah. <laughs> um all right. So yeah, we're, Chris we're, and I both have infinite jest in our backgrounds. Yeah. Where, where's uh, Did you actually read it? <laughs> yeah, years ago. Uh, I'm not like I, I actively read it. reading it. I use that to prop up my computer sometimes. Mine's just uh, decor for, yeah. for, for, <laughs> for my background. So we're selling books. We're just there's a lot of really good books out there, and I think uh, you know we should be buying them. But people are selling books that's all i'm just kind of you I was like a the idea i the like book. the idea that we're selling books uh so that's that's where we're at this week um i was struggling with that segment all right inside city of smag here's what we got going on we have a new gary martin blog just got published today um he recaps his first ever indoor track race he's also racing this weekend uh he's racing the 800 at penn state so if you're out there, give him a couple good cheers for us. Uh, interesting tweet that you put out, Mac. Uh, you had a very similar first race as Gary. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the Vin Lanana special, I guess, if you come out as like the one of the best milers in the country at high school. Um, Throws you into yeah, DMR, te- run yeah, similar Texas times. A&M, Texas A&M, Friday, Saturday meet. I won the mile in 403 on the first day and then we ran 929 in the DMR. Um, I think that's what it's when 929. Right? Yeah, when 929 used to be good. That, that used to get um, you something. The next day. Yeah, that put us at like number one or number two probably for the year. But yeah, I ran a 254 leg uh, for the 1200. And yeah, I think Gary's Gary's on a on a great path. Yeah, sweet. Uh, we have Dalila Muhammad on the City Smack podcast this week, as as kind of uh, Mac noted before. There's some really cool stuff there where she breaks down just why everyone's gotten so much faster in the 400 hurdles. And I think like I was actually particularly blown away by the fact that she told us just how injured she was at the world championships and still managed to walk away with a bronze medal. But two weeks before and like she couldn't run and she was seeing the physio three times a day while at the world championships. So um, pretty insightful stuff there because, you know, everyone got really wrapped up and blown away by Sydney's performance that, you know, sometimes you lose sight of what is the story behind the people who finished second and third. And so we got that from Delilah in that interview. So check it out on this podcast feed. Uh, like we mentioned before, we've got a full uh, workout highlight compilation coming from Mac with OAC and then the boots on the ground this weekend. We'll have Jesse Gabriel hitting the mix zone for us at in Spokane for the Lilac Grand Prix. David Melly and Justin Britton will be holding it down at BU. And I will be at the Dr. Sander invite with Johnny Zhang and Johnny Pace. Uh, so that's, I think, what we've got across the board inside Sidious this week. So uh, lots to look forward to. We'll catch everyone again next week. I love track and field, and it's it's back. And I love Olipop. And Olipop. <laughs> <laughs>